picking up at verse 51 and uh, to verse 66, the, the burial of Jesus. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we ask you to, uh, Lord, help us focus our hearts and minds on your word in this very critical passage uh, of the burial of Jesus and this wonderful story of two heroes of our faith, Joseph of Arimathea and, and, uh, and Nicodemus. Lord, help us to uh, really uh, be impacted by your word this morning, that we would just continue to see the, the ongoing details of, of your death, of your burial, of your resurrection, Lord, and, and what it means to us in terms of our salvation. So uh, bless the, the hearing of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. There's, um, again, when we kind of go through this section, obviously last week becomes a uh, uh, very critical. The week before, we kind of looked at the torture and the trials of Jesus uh, here in Matthew's gospel. Last week was uh, Jesus on, on the cross, obviously uh, a critical uh, message. Uh, that, that alone is, is, is not enough, though, to really give us the gospel. Uh, we need to see not only did Jesus die on, uh, on the cross, but we need to see the, uh, the the, the evidence for that. And the evidence for it, we're going to look at this morning. And it, it's his burial. Sometimes when we read the, uh, the Apostles' Creed, now, uh, whether, whatever maybe church tradition you grew up in, whether it was Roman Catholic or a mainline denomination, it doesn't matter. They all had the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed somewhere uh, in the hymnal. And uh, when you come across that line and one holy Catholic, that just means worldwide. It doesn't mean Roman Catholic. So, uh, us that grew up in a, a Protestant uh, denomination said, said that word as well, right on Sunday morning, Catholic, you know, uh, it's part of it. Let me read it to you. Uh, of course, if, I should say, if you're, if you're younger, you think this is a Rich Mullen song, but, uh, which it was, but uh, uh, it actually goes back a little further than Rich Mullins. Uh, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. That's our subject this morning. Last week, crucified. This week, dead. We need to have that verification. Next week, uh, and again, uh, buried, and then, of course, resurrection. It goes on, he descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. It's, it's almost hard to not break into the melody of the Rich Mullen songs if you've heard it. And of course, part of that, the chorus of that song is appropriate uh, where he says, says, I am not making it, it is making me. Uh, these things are, are a lot of theology uh, trimmed down to a very, a very uh, uh, in a sense, an economy of words. They certainly speak a, a, a great deal and they're the essence of our faith and that's what's making us. It's not, not that we made this or made this up. Uh, it's quite the opposite. I place my faith in this, and it changes me. And, uh, and part of that, and again here the emphasis, is this idea of the burial of Jesus. From a, uh, an article in uh, Prison Magazine, one writer said this about Jesus. He said, the life of Jesus is bracketed between two impossibilities, a virgin's womb and an empty tomb. Jesus entered our world through a door marked no entrance and left through a door marked no exit. And uh, uh, I think that's a pretty good uh, sum, uh, summation. Uh, it's all about the fact that God entered this world 
perfect and sinless through the womb of Mary, and he exited this world and, and, uh, in terms of his resurrection body, in terms of an empty tomb, and, and that'll be the, the, uh, the subject of our study next week. Let's take a look again at the fact that the burial of Jesus is critical to our faith. There were powerful events that took place before the burial, and we see that in verse 51 to 56. We alluded to this a little bit last week. I want to look at it a little more in detail this morning. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, Mary the mother of Zebedee's son. So first, uh, the thing that we mentioned last week, powerful event in the temple. Uh, again, the veil being rent in two. And we talked about the fact that that is even recorded in uh, secular history. Josephus writes about it, writes about the fact that once it was torn into, it was actually, they, they stitched it back up later. But again, Paul says that that veil represented the flesh of Christ, the body of Christ. Uh, it says, at that moment. So what moment was that? Well, at the moment that Jesus died. When Jesus died, he opened the veil. That veil was a barrier. It kept everybody out of the presence of God. Not in this temple, but in the first temple, uh, in the tabernacle, that's where the Shekinah glory of God, the visible presence of God was. And that's where the high priest could go once a year. But there were other barriers in the temple. Uh, if you were to walk into the temple in that day, in Jesus' day, anybody could walk in, even Gentiles, large courtyard, a lot of guys teaching over here, be markets and so forth. It's a very large area, several acres, uh, a very large area. And anyone could go there and learn about the God of heaven, the one true God. That's why it was open to everyone. Uh, and that's why God placed it at the crossroads of the world, in, in a sense. But then there was a barrier. If you were a Gentile, you couldn't go beyond a barrier. And there was a sign that said, if you are a Gentile, go beyond this point to risking your own life, uh, in other words. So there was a barrier. The men and the women could pass through there, but then there was another barrier where the women could go no farther. They were, they were separated. Even today, if you go to Jerusalem, uh, you go to the western wall, you're going to see a barrier that separates where the women pray and where the, uh, the, the men pray but a barrier. The men could go beyond that, but then there was a barrier where they could no, not go beyond. Only the priest could go beyond that. But even if with the priest, there was a barrier, because even though you had those Levi genes, you still couldn't go beyond that last barrier because only the high priest and only once a year could he pass by where that veil was. When Jesus Christ dies on the cross, at that moment, again, the barriers are erased. The one in the temple all of them in the temple. This is why Paul says this in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ. All one. Uh, all the same. We can all pass through no longer a barrier. Uh, it's a powerful event in the temple. And there's a powerful event geologically. It says the earth shook and the rocks split. That means there was a massive earthquake. And there's some pretty big rocks in Israel. And if uh, a few of those would be split in two, that would kind of shake you up. Well, look at the Roman soldiers. I mean, these guys had lived in that area a while. Other areas, as in like Turkey, were uh, the many earthquakes. But uh, they'd experienced a lot, certainly a lot on the, on the battlefield. But it says they were terrified. So this is a radical, a radical earthquake. I don't, I don't know if you've... Uh, you know, we got shook a little bit a few years ago, but, the, you know, the epicenter was off the big island. We talked to friends over there and everything. I wasn't really terrified. I was just more curious. I felt everything rocking. I don't know what it was like at your house, but, uh, you know, I just kind of went to the front door. I was watching the power lines do this going, hope they don't fall because <laughs> yeah, that's my driveway. You know, we're not going anywhere. And, uh, but not terrified. But I think there were a, a few people uh, except for the people from Japan. One of the visiting pastors, Calvary Chapel pastor, was actually over here on a tour in the, in the hotel. It's, it was one of the ones in North Kona. I forget which one it was. And, uh, and when, the, when everything started rocking over there, 
In Japan, they get a lot of earthquakes. So he said, yeah, he said, I talked to him later. He said, all of the tourists from the mainland all, all went under the tables and people were yelling and screaming. He says, we saw it as a short buffet line and they all just went up and got their food. <laughs> so not everybody's terrified, but, uh, but uh, these guys were used to it uh, and they were still ter terrified. But again, the, the earthquake is really a symbol of God's judgment. We see in the book of Revelation, uh, there's a few coming. In Revelation 6, 12, it says, uh, John says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, uh, and there was a great earthquake. Revelation 16, then there came, great, uh, came flashings of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and severe, a severe earthquake. No earthquake um, like it had ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split in three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. A great earthquake at the, at the moment that Jesus dies on the cross. So uh, geological events. There's a powerful event, again, that involved resurrection. And this is one we, we spoke about last week that uh, is interesting. This idea that, uh, that um, uh, the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Notice, after Jesus' resurrection, then they went into the holy city where they appeared to many people. It's only recorded in Matthew's gospel. So it's not like we could go to John or go to Mark and go, give me some details here. This is weird, you know. It's, uh, and I think it's weird in, unless we really understand a couple of things that happened. One is the event took place after the, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, again, you can read it, uh, especially in the NIV, and it almost, it almost sounds like, like the tombs, the, the, at that moment, the tombs broke open and these guys, not all, but some came out apparently with some kind of resurrected bodies because people could see them. Uh, and then they just kind of kicked back, hung out for three days, <laughs> three nights uh, in the cemetery. And then after Jesus' resurrection, they thought, hey, why don't we go to town, see what's going on? Okay. And then they all strolled into town. Uh, that's not what happened. I mean, <laughs> that's not what happened. This event takes place after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul makes reference to it in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 in this way. He says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Not the second or the third or the fifth, the first, first fruits. Remember, Jesus eats the Passover lamb on, on Thursday night with his guys. Uh, he's arrested during the night. He dies the, the next day, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That Sunday following Passover, as will be the case here in, in a few weeks, uh, is always then uh, the celebration of first fruits. Springtime, some of the crops are in. They're not fully in, but some of the crops are starting to come in. And so as an act of faith, they don't cut a lot of them down, but they cut a little bit of them down. They bring them into the temple and, and basically present them as an offering to the Lord. This isn't everything, but it's a little bit. Uh, and we expect a lot more that God's going to bless, but we're going to honor him this way in terms of, of first fruits. Jesus rise, rises from the dead, fulfilling that Jewish feast of first fruits. That's why we worship on Sundays is because Jesus fulfilled a Jewish feast on, on a Sunday. That's why we gather on a, on a Sunday as opposed to on, on Saturday. Uh, and here Jesus is. So what are these guys? Well, they're, they're just part of that idea as first fruits. Uh, Jesus rises from the dead, not all, some, some, just a little bit, first fruits. They're given some kind of resurrected bodies and they make their way into Jerusalem and totally freak out everyone. I, I don't know what happened, but <laughs> I would think that uh, they must have freaked every, everybody out. And uh, uh, what I want to kind of uh, just point out of the fact is that, is that there is a building momentum of evidence in terms of who Jesus is, uh, that he is the Messiah and that he died for, our, uh, for the sins of the world. Uh, from the fulfillment of all these prophecies that Matthew was laying out. Now we're getting to the crucial area of his death, his burial, his resurrection. And it's all about evidence. It's all about eyewitnesses. It's all about a sequence of events. Uh, so that we can say that Christianity in its e essence is evidential. Uh, we believe it because of the evidence. Now, sometimes we just give our hearts to Jesus Christ because we're miserable and we realize that we're sinful and we need to be forgiven, but it should bring us great assurance like it did me. Once I was saved, walking with the Lord, I saw God changing my life that 
this was not a leap into the dark. It was a step into the light. Uh, I think it helps us when we go to share our faith with others. And there's this, this whole, I just kind of hope you'll see this building picture of incredible evidence, incredible eyewitness testimony uh, that are all about the death, the burial, uh, and the resurrection, including these guys that, uh, that go into the city. And uh, let me just say this, by the way, did it have the impact you think that it would have? I think we have a tendency to think that, man, why didn't more people get saved? Are you kidding me? All this stuff is going on. They did. Uh, Peter gets up, preaches his first sermon, 3,000 get saved. Within a few more days, a couple thousand more. Josephus tells us by the end of the first century, in Jerusalem and just that surrounding area, there's about 100,000 believers. Church is doing pretty well, growing under persecution. It's still growing like crazy. Why? Because of all of the evidence. And, uh, and it's mounting here. Uh, we get to the fourth thing. There's powerful events uh, were witnessed by the military. Verse 54, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Uh, a couple of things that are about this are, you know, again, they were, well, let's just dial it back a little bit. These are the guys that beat him to a pulp, right? This is not, not like Different guys, the same guy, same centurion that's overseeing the whole thing. Uh, one of these guys may or may not have been the guy cracking the whip, peeling the flesh off of his back, but they were there. They were all there. These are the guys that pushed the crown of thorn on his head, put one of their robes on him and kneel before him and mock him and then beat him in the face. Same guys. Now the same guys march him out there and the same guys watch him from the cross say, repeatedly, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As the Pharisees and everybody else, remember last week talked about the fact that even the passerbyers, everybody constantly mocked him on the cross. It wasn't a casual thing. It was constant. What was Jesus? And again, in our sermon that we gave, I think, a few Easter ago, ago on the seven scenes of Jesus from the cross, we read one time, Father, forgive them. He said it repeatedly. It's present tense. He said it over and over again. Didn't say all those things over and over again. But these guys are there gambling for his clothes. This is all going on. Their darkness covers the whole land. It's a supernatural event for three hours. It's a full moon. It's Passover. So this is not some kind of an eclipse or anything. They're watching this whole thing. There is such a radical earthquake. The rocks are splitting open that these guys are terrified. And, and again, we mentioned that uh, that these guys that are part of the Praetorium Guard are, are kind of like special forces or whatever. These, these aren't just your average, average troops. These are guys with a lot of combat experience, and they are terrified. Uh, and they become witnesses of the death of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's significant. Notice, secondly, that the centurion, those guarding Jesus, confess that, he, that Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 54 they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. They confirm his true identity as the Messiah. Uh, Luke's gospel again says this, and I want to read it from a new King James, Luke 23, 47. So when the centurion saw what happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. That term glorified can also be translated, he praised God. Now, you know, you, you, could, you could make a real case for these guys are saved. I mean, because they're, uh, have they changed their mind and repented about who Jesus is? They've gone from beating him in the face and mocking him to, to saying he was a righteous man. He was the son of God. Uh, God should be glorified through this. So there, there's some powerful events that take place leading up to the, uh, the, um, the burial. There's one other thing that they do uh, that is uh, of critical importance, and it's recorded in John 19. Somebody asked me about it last week, and um, I wanted to go over it. I think it's, uh, it's interesting, just if you're a Bible student, but it's uh, a critical. John 19, verse 32. There it says, The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, uh, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony. Who's the man that saw it? John. 
He's the guy writing. And his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you may also believe. John says, I was right there. I saw the whole thing. Uh, again, we said last week, how long did it normally take them to die of crucifixion? Two or three days. Uh, and, uh, but they want them down off the crosses before sundown, before the next Shabbat begins. And um, we'll, uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. We'll mention a couple of verses in, in a moment. But notice that uh, they, the way they did it was to break the legs. Then they, they can't lift themselves up, catch another breath, breath. They would die within minutes of suffocation. They come to Jesus. Can they break his legs? No. In Psalms, Psalm 22, it says, not one of his bones will be broken. So it's critical that they find him dead already, which they do. But they're professional executioners. Their jobs are on the line. They have to have verification. How do they do it? They pierce his side and outflows blood and water. As professional executioners, they know his heart is already ruptured. That's why there's blood and water mixed together. And any uh, medical expert will tell you the same uh, today. Now, again... It's critical for us that his death is verified. Have you ever heard people say the, what we call the swoon theory? Well, he didn't really die. You know, he suffered a lot. He lost a lot of blood. I'll give you that. But, you know, you take that body, you put it in a cool tomb, you put it away for a day or so. He was probably, uh, uh, you know, in a slight coma or whatever, but apparently he revived, but he really wasn't. No, he, <laughs> he's dead. Uh, and this becomes very critical, the verification of, uh, of the death of Jesus Christ. It also fulfills prophecy in another way. A familiar passage when Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth, Revelation 19, because uh, the Jewish nation back in the land, we see it today. Uh, we see that the nations of the earth are all turning against Israel. Uh, e even now, we're witnessing that. So we know that we're, we're as, about as close to the rapture as we could possibly get. Uh, we, we know that... Uh, uh, that a point in time, uh, persecution will be terrible against them uh, and through the tribulation at the end, they will cry out, believe that uh, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus said to them, to Israel, to Jerusalem in particular, you won't see me again until you say, I'm the Messiah, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And when they do, this will be fulfilled, Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. So Jesus returns, and he will have that scar in his side where he was pierced. Now again, John tells us very explicitly that I was there, I saw it, and my testimony is true. He's very emphatic. Let me read it again. The man who saw it has given testimony. This is just typical, refers to himself in the second person. And his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you may also believe. What is so critical here? That he died, that blood and water came out. It's so important to John that he mentions it later when he writes, writes his first epistle. He says this in, in 1 John 5, 16. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater, because it is a testimony of God which he has given about his Son. What's the testimony God's given about his son? That he died on the cross. It's verified because when they pierced his heart, blood and water came out. Why should this be significant? John tells us in verse 10, anyone who believes in the son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may only doubt occasionally that you really have eternal life. That's not actually what it says there. This whole thing is so that we can know that we know that we have eternal life. How do we know that we have eternal life in Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross and was buried. 
we've got we've to have them there or the empty tomb doesn't mean anything. You understand what I mean? So this becomes critical in this building evidence of, uh, of our faith. Uh, the last thing here is, is uh, these powerful events were witnessed by women from Galilee. And I don't think it, Matthew's kind of writing along and says, well, I don't know what to write here, so I'll just mention the gals are here. No, I think all of this is obviously very important because they are witnesses. They're eyewitnesses uh, all along. A couple of things about this group of women. It says they cared for his needs. It's present tense, which means it was an ongoing thing. And uh, if you traveled around with about 50 people, as they did in caravans and so forth, and uh, picture camping, camping with 50 people, and you're responsible for the food and eating. <laughs> It's present tense. It's ongoing. By the time you get breakfast done, you're planning lunch. And by the time you get that done, you're figuring out dinner and uh, making sure it's all ready. These gals worked very hard and, uh, and caring uh, for these guys and, and the others. Luke 8, uh, 8, 1 gives us a little more background. It says about them. It says, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. So you have this group of, of women who, and we know there are many others, cured of evil spirits cured of diseases. God had uh, healed them through the ministry of Jesus Christ and, and they become part of the ministry and they follow him all the way from Galilee. They are there when Jesus is carrying the cross and Jesus says to them, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. They watch the whole thing uh, and then they're there uh, at the cross as well. It becomes critical because they follow him right to the tomb. They see him buried and they go back to the empty tomb. These women are, are critical in terms of being eyewitnesses of the whole ministry of Jesus Christ. Um, Luke 23, 49 says, But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. That term, uh, watching in the Greek, means uh, it's where we get our word uh, theater. I mean, in other words, they're staring intently at Jesus on the cross, and they're, there's no distraction. They're, as you can imagine, they're, they're, taking it, they're taking it all in. Uh, and they become witnesses uh, of the entire sequence of events. So there's powerful events that take place before the burial. Uh, secondly, there's a tomb provided for the burial uh, of Jesus. And that's in verse 57 to 61. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself became a disciple of Jesus. Going from Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body and and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Again, the women are there observing all of the details. But notice first there's a, a request made for the, for the body and and there's a time factor. It says, verse 57, as evening approached. That means it's between three and sunset. It's, that's what it means, as evening approached. And they're trying to get it done because the next Shabbat or the next Sabbath is, uh, is coming. It becomes critical to them in their Jewish mind, their Jewish thinking, because of a couple of verses. Now, just to re-solidify the sequence of events here, uh, Leviticus 23, 4 says, these are the Lord's appointed feasts, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the, notice it's the 14th day of the month. What's the next day? On the 15th day of the month, the next day, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread without yeast. On the first day hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Again, so you've got, you've got Passover, you've got the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and goes for a week. Friday. Then you have a, a regular Sabbath, a regular Shabbat that would begin the eve Friday evening and go to, to Saturday evening. And then you've got Jesus rises from the dead on Sunday. That Sunday is always the, again, following Passover is the 
feast of first fruits. So Jesus rises on, on Sunday morning. Sometimes, again, people take issue with this idea of three days and three nights, that somehow it's got to be three complete 24-hour periods. It's just a Jewish idiom, three days and three nights. And um, we got the book of Esther. She, she's going to go before the king and intervene. She says, pray and fast for, 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 for three days. And, but on the third day, she's going in. She doesn't wait to three 24 hours. It's just, a, it's just an idiom. It's just a figure of speech. So, uh, so we've got Jesus rising on Sunday morning. But why get the body off the tree, off the cross before sunset? Well, Deuteronomy 21, 22. If a, man is, uh, if a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day. Because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land. The Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. They want to get it done before the Shabbat, but they also want to get it done because... Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. He doesn't need to be any further of a curse. They don't want to see anyone be able to point to this, this verse. Although Paul makes reference to the idea in Galatians 3.13 that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on the tree. He did hang on the tree. He hung on the cross. He took the curse for us. But time is of the essence. They want to get him down off of the cross. And so the request is made, secondly, by secret believers. Joseph, he's uh, obviously a wealthy guy, and um, he's a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and we'll, we'll read in a moment that uh, Nicodemus is, is part of this whole thing uh, to get it done. And uh, we know about Nicodemus from John chapter 3, also a member of the Sanhedrin. And we know that they weren't there when Jesus was condemned to die. Because uh, they all voted to condemn him. But we'll read it in a moment. These guys were not there and they were not part of it. Um, Joseph of Arimathea, you're going to want to meet him in heaven. I mean, he is like one of the heroes of the faith. Um, was this like a risky deal? Let's take a, he goes from being a secret believer, right? right? I mean, he's a, he's a disciple of Jesus for some time. How long? We don't know. He's a Pharisee. He knows the word of God. He's watched Jesus. Jesus is coming Three times a year to Jerusalem, a lot of conversations, a lot of teaching, a lot of stuff going on. He's figured it out. But he's a secret believer. But God the Holy Spirit, I believe, gives him the courage to do something that was critical at this point. What happens to Jesus uh, if Joseph of Arimathea does not do this? Jesus dies a criminal on the cross. His body would be taken down and thrown into an open garbage dump. Now, that doesn't sound good to us by any means, but uh, it becomes critical in the terms of evidence for our faith because would it be easy for someone to steal the body in an open garbage dump? Would it, uh, it's in the Valley of Hinnon. I mean, they had fires down. The whole thing could have been burned up. Uh, dogs could have come by and got it or whatever. Do you understand that? If Jesus' body ends up that way, can you imagine how difficult it would be to prove to someone that death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They would just go, come on, his body was thrown in a dump. Anybody could have taken it. Are you kidding me? Resurrection? You got to be kidding me. This is very critical. But did this take a lot of courage? What Jesus die for? As an insurrectionist, he's against Rome. Joseph of Arimathea walks in and says, I want his body. You're one of them? Crucify him too. He had to know it could have gone down that way. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't walk in knowing... This is cool. It's all right. Because I know how the Bible turns out. You know, I end up being a hero. He doesn't know. <laughs> he doesn't know how it's going to go down. But he has the courage to go and do this. And apparently, Pilate recognizes him. He's known in the community. He's allowed to come and make the address. No argument. You want him. You got him. And, uh, and, he's, and he's taken out. A couple of verses, background about him. Mark 15, 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member. Not just a member. A prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God boldly to Pilate uh, and asked for the Jesus' body. And we kind of miss it here in the Greek, but uh, basically there is an indication that uh, he begged in earnest for this body. It wasn't like, hey, can I have the body? Yeah, I don't care. Take it on out. No, he, he really had to make his case. It was not a fast conversation. And uh, Pilate had already had enough on his mind over Jesus of Nazareth 
I, he, I think he's probably trying to be careful in everything he said and did concerning this whole thing at this point. But he's a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, he makes his case and he allows him to have the body of Jesus. Notice also that he was messianic. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. That means he's waiting for the Messiah to come. He had messianic expectation all along and he realizes Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, Luke's gospel tells us this. This is where we get Nicodemus into the picture. Luke 23, 50. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of um, Arimathea and he was waiting for the, for the kingdom of God. So uh, no, no longer is he uh, a secret believer in, uh, in, in Jesus Christ. And of course then Nicodemus we know is there with him and they take the body. And remember Nicodemus is, is the teacher in Israel. He's not a rabbi, he's the rabbi of Israel. He is the head guy. And he comes of course to Jesus at night in John chapter 3. And sometimes we, uh, we kind of like to give him a hard time. Nick at night, you know, he comes because maybe he wants it to be a little bit secretive, which maybe he did. Or it could be that, I mean, he's the teacher in Israel. He probably had a little, a few people pressing on him during the day in the temple, during those feast days as, uh, as well. Either way, he comes to Jesus at night and, um, and he realizes there's something going on. And then Jesus tells him that, uh, Nicodemus, you want to see the kingdom of God? No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And he's, Nicodemus is really shocked by that because that was a familiar statement within Judaism to be born again. If you were a Gentile and you uh, proselytized, you went through the mikvah, got baptized, you were born again as you went into Judaism. Well, he can't do that. Uh, if, you were, uh, if you're a young guy uh, and you, you were bar mitzvah, another way of saying that, would, you're born again. You get married. Hey, you're born again. A new life beginning. If you become the head of a rabbinical school, all right, you're born again. So Nicodemus says, how can I be born again? Uh, I've done all these things already. Would I have to enter my mother's womb a second time? Is that how I can be born again? Uh, Jesus says, no. You know, you've got to be born from above. And, and we have that wonderful explanation of, of the gospel. And I think we're all thankful for that where Jesus culminates by his so of the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He's telling that to the chief rabbi of Israel. And, uh, and evidently he, whether, whether it was then or there was later, at some point in time, he understands Jesus is, is the Messiah. Again, these guys, they're both Pharisees. They have most of the Old Testament completely memorized. Some of these prophecies, some of these scriptures had to be coming to their minds as they watch the events play out before them. But tremendous courage, what these guys do. And it's, do you understand, it's critical to our salvation. Would you like to try to explain the, the, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ if he was never in a, in a tomb with a Roman seal and a Roman guard around it? Do you understand it would be just a little bit tougher? But uh, these guys, moved by the Holy Spirit, really become great heroes of the faith. And notice also it's a borrowed tomb. Uh, verse uh, 39 of John 19 he, Joseph, was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This in accordance with Christian burial, no, excuse, Jewish burial customs. Very important because we, we know exactly what they were. We'll talk about that a little bit more next week. The place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, nearby what? Nearby where he was crucified, they laid Jesus there. Uh, this makes for a lot of interesting things, just, just what we know about this. Jesus was, was buried in a tomb that was borrowed, that was built for someone else and somebody else's family. It was somebody that was very rich. Again, Joseph lives in Arimathea. Why does he get a tomb in Jerusalem? Because he's wealthy and it was a very cool thing. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you had the money, you get your tomb in Jerusalem. Major status, right? And so, uh, and so he does that. Uh, it's got to be near where he's crucified. It's got to be in a garden uh, setting. 
And, uh, and there's a place that uh, matches all those descriptions in Jerusalem today. It's the place where you go if you're on a tour and stuff. And it's, it's very interesting. You can't know that you know that you know that that's where Jesus rose from the dead. But there's a lot of fascinating things about it. For example, the fact that uh, it's, it's right outside the place where there's a, a, a church in honor of Stephen because he was stoned there. And we know that Jesus was crucified in the area where the stoning normally took place. Uh, there's, a, there's a cistern that's there, you know, underground cavern that's been created, holds 250,000 gallons of water. There's no speculation that there was a garden there. They had the water for it. There's only three in Jerusalem that are that, are that large. Uh, they've even found an ancient olive press, so they're not even figured, you know, it's no speculation of what was growing in the garden. Uh, add that to the fact that this tomb that's there, uh, scientists have gone in and they've, they can't find any traces of bodily decay in, in any way. So there's a, a large tomb that's built for someone that's rich, uh, the right proximity. Uh, and, and the way the tombs were, you would walk in, and like me, uh, and I've been in it, you kind of have to duck down. Uh, and to the right is the, like a little room where, where the body would be laid out. It would be laid out, and we'll find, they, they wrap it up. It's kind of mummified. Uh, they would come back later, basically, after time and nature has done its thing and it's only bones, they would collect the bones, put them in a box, an ossuary, put it on a shelf over here. Next person in the family dies. Kind of repeat, repeat the process till everybody's in there together. But no one has ever buried in there. Seems to be a borrowed tomb that was never used. The other part of it is very interesting is that the person that built it Whoever got buried there, it wasn't the person it was intended for. So th- th- there's a very interesting Jesus was temporarily in a borrowed tomb. It's not such a great gift by Joseph of Arimathea. After all, he only loaned it to him for three days. But uh, I don't know if he knows he's going to resurrect from the dead in three days yet or, or not. But uh, uh, very interesting. But in that tomb there is considered to be the tomb of the family tomb of, of Joseph of Arimathea. And then secondly, there's additional witnesses to the burial at the tomb. Again, the women are there. Mary Magdalene. Uh, the other Mary, they sat opposite. They watched the whole thing. They've been eyewitnesses uh, all, all along. So there's powerful events that take place before the burial. The tomb has been provided. And then lastly, get an amen there, lastly. Pilate ordered the tomb guarded after the burial of Jesus. After preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So the Jewish leaders go to Pilate with a request. <laughs> Notice again the hypocrisy here. They're breaking the, sh- it's the Sabbath, right? It's the Shabbat. And here they are taking care of business, probably traveling further than they were supposed to. And before they wouldn't even go into the praetorium, into this Gentile dwelling. But now, no problem. They just go right, they just go right in. Again, the hypocrisy, because they're very concerned. Because secondly, they remember the words of Jesus. Now, this has got to be at least a little bit fascinating, the fact that Jesus' own disciples couldn't seem to remember that part about resurrection. Even after his death, they couldn't seem to remember. But then once he rose from the dead, then they remembered, he said, I will rise again on the third day. But his chief enemies, they remembered. Which tells us also that Jesus said this publicly many times. It's not like he said just to the apostles, oh, and I will rise again in three days, you know, so keep that in mind. No, he said it publicly. They knew about it. They were very concerned about it. So concerned that on the Sabbath, they would still walk there. 
On the Sabbath, they would walk into a Gentile home. On the Sabbath, the pilot they wanted to have nothing to do with, they would go and beg and ask for one more favor, which you can imagine they weren't thrilled to do any of those things, but they were very concerned about what if? What if somehow his body is now not able to be found? What would it mean to the testimony of all these followers of Jesus? We must prevent that. And again, I... <laughs> God is orchestrating all of these events. This is like the greatest thing that could possibly happen to post a Roman guard around the tomb and put a Roman seal over it. This is just, this is great. This is, uh, this is awesome. Uh, because thirdly, a Roman guard would remain at, at the tomb. Uh, and again, remind you that these are like uh, special forces guys. It, it is said historically that four of them back to back could guard uh, an area of 100 square feet against anyone, any number of people, no matter how they're armed, four of them. And they have an entire guard posted there. Do you really think that Peter and the other 10 boys could, the fishermen, the tax collector, <laughs> these guys with their two swords, could go on and take on these four Navy SEALs or whatever they were there? I mean, it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, and so that's a wonderful thing. It removes any possibility that somehow they could have come in and, and removed the body. The other thing that's, uh, the, the, that they did that was great is they put the Roman seal. The Roman seal would have been clay, both sides. Again, this, this stone would have uh, been circular. There was a trench, like a canal, for it to roll in, close the door. It would be on a decline to close it. You would have to be able to roll it slightly uphill to open it. And uh, it would have taken, a lot, it takes a lot of guys and, and the right leverage to, to, to move one of these stones. They're, they're, they're very heavy. They put the seal on it, the rope in between, and that then becomes the, sim the symbol of, of the authority of Rome. If you touch it, you're executed on the spot. Not if you break it, if you touch it, you're executed on the spot. And the Roman seal is there. Praise God. I mean, this is like awesome, you know, that, the, that, these, guys, that these guys did this. It should mean, mean a lot to, to us in terms of... Um, how secure we can be in our faith to know that Jesus died on the cross. How do we know? Because blood and water flowed out of his side when he was pierced. Because there were eyewitnesses that watched the whole progress. There were women that saw him going to the cross, on the cross, at the tomb. And of course, these gals come back on Sunday. As soon as the Sabbath is over, they, they make their way right back to the tomb. Uh, you've got these, uh, a centurion. Uh, who basically, with all the events that he sees, says, he's the son of God. We should glorify in all this. He was a righteous man. I mean, these, these guys are scared to death. They've seen all these things, and they, they've been a lot of crucifixions. But they've never seen anything like this. You talk about repentance, to go from beating Jesus Christ physically to praising God for him. I, I would say that was a little bit of a change of mind. We might call that re repentance. There's some powerful events that are surrounding all of this leading up to the resurrection. Once before, Jesus had been wrapped in linen. We'll talk more about that next week. But uh, when he was wrapped in linen, the first time it also was a, by a man named Joseph. And he was placed into a stone manger instead of a stone tomb. But there's another implication here as well that needs to be considered. And that is, there's another person that in a sense is wrapped in linen. He's called the high priest and it would be once a year. And it would be when he would go into the Holy of Holies to represent the people. But first, he would have to make an offering for his own sin. Then he would have to make an offering for the people, for the nation. And then he would have to sprinkle it on God's mercy seat. And if it was accepted then, if it was accepted, he would live. And then he could come out before the people, come out on the steps where everybody would be waiting and he could lift his arms up and bless the people because God had accepted the offering for that year. That's what Jesus does when he comes out of the tomb. That is the evidence that God accepted his perfect offering for, for our sin. And we'll begin next week again to examine the, uh, the empty tomb. That's the other part of the critical element here. I just pray that, um, that we, you know, we, we kind of know the events, but I think when we break them down into the details, I hope it helps solidify the evidence is overwhelming for us. 
Uh, we get attacked a lot by an enemy that wants us to doubt our salvation, doubt God's grace, doubt you know our eternal destiny, doubt what this all what what I should be living for in in this life, which is for eternity. At the same time, we have friends who doubt our story and our testimony in the gospel, but we can't give them the the evidence, the verification for what we're saying, and be able to say that. Christianity in its very evidence is, in its essence, is evidential. It's based on evidence. Uh, when I came to faith in Jesus Christ, it was not because it was based on evidence. I was desperate. <laughs> I was just desperate. But man, I was so thankful once I began to learn the, that, that there was the evidence there. I remember somebody uh, driving by, uh, we were driving by Southern California, and I, we saw a sign on a church that said, Walter Martin, Apologetics Seminar. And I asked uh, folks in the car with this, what, what do we got to apologize for? What does that mean? I, I didn't know. And they said, no, I, Walter Martin, he, he's an apologist. So he's good at saying he's sorry? No, no, he's, <laughs> it means reason. First Peter, be ready always to give every man a uh, a reason for the hope that lies within. It's that word reason is the uh, apologia. It's our reasoned arguments why we place our faith in, uh, in Jesus Christ. And there are many, but there's a lot of building evidence. It just keeps mounting, it keeps mounting. And I re remind you, sometimes we have a tendency to think, well, why didn't they get it? They did. They did. Within a century, you got 100,000 under persecution, still committing their lives to, uh, to Jesus Christ, no matter what it might, might cost them. Uh, I don't want to belabor this too much, but uh, I will anyway. I, um, I saw this great interview. It's on Jerusalem Online, but it was from a Fox special. There's a, uh, a guy whose father is one of the leaders in Hamas, and his, uh, his son, he's in his uh, probably you know, early 20s, mid-20s, and, uh, and he, became a, he became a Christian. Uh, it's, an incredible, uh, it's an incredible testimony. But of course, living in Ramallah, he's living all, I mean, he was the president of the youth movement of Hamas. And um, he ends up receiving Jesus Christ because walking through the old city of Jerusalem, somebody approached him and just invited him to a Bible study. He went, he read the Gospel of John, and when it said, Jesus said, love your enemies. He says, that verse changed my life because I had been taught from a child and I saw death every day growing up in that town is that you hate your enemies. And when Jesus said, you're to love them, I wanted to know more about this. So he took the gospel of John home and secretly read it, secretly prayed, became a, a Christian. And of course, doing that, he, in a sense, he's signing his own, his own death, death certificate uh, and so for two years, he, he prays and kind of meets secretly with other believers until they can get him out of that environment. He's, he's living in San Diego, learning to surf, too. I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> Incredible testimony, if you, if you get a chance. I'm going to try to try to somehow buy, buy it. I'm sure it's available on DVD. Uh, God can so radically uh, change, change our lives uh, and, and deliver us out of from such complete darkness and the good news about that is that everything that we're saying and sharing is verifiable. And, uh, and there's the evidence for it. So pray that, uh, again, as we go through this, it would mean something to us personally, but it would be an equipping that we'd be able to share our faith more openly while we have the opportunity. Because uh, if things keep going the way they are politically... Uh, that's going to be limited more and more and more. There's going to see, a, we're going to see uh, everybody I've talked to more of an intrusion of the federal government into our lives in every aspect. That there's a there's an agenda to do that. It's moving forward, and um, under the guise of the everybody's focused on the economic quote collapse in the economy and everything, that there's a social agenda that's moving forward that is incredibly frightening if we if we look at it, and so. We need to take advantage of, uh, of what we've got, you I'm know, now. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted. I came. Jesus, you.